Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the first of a double bill today because James Fenelon is joining me in an hour and a half talking about the 11th Airborne. But right now, joining me for this show is Luke Turner. He's a writer and editor who has written this new book, uh, Men at War, about which one reviewer said a bracingly compassionately, compassionate, unapologetically sensual and profoundly personal reclamation of a part of our national heritage that is too often hijacked. How about that for a, for a bit of blurb on your book there? And it's an amazing book. And and I, and I will talk about it with Luke in a minute, but just um, it covers so many areas. So I'm going to bring Luke in. So good evening, Luke. How are you doing today? I'm good. Sorry. I was just muting the other browser that was going on. I'm good. Thank you. Yes. Good. Yeah. So, as I said in the introduction there, your book, you know, it, it, on the one hand, it's conventional, you know, autobiography about your growing up and discovering who you are as a person but it's also you tell these little pockets of, of World War II history um, and also you bring up the idea that not everybody who served in World War II or who has an interest in World War II fit neatly into the little compartments that we have kind of made for them o over the years and I think that's where we're going to go with this conversation is these these kind of classic stereotypical characters i've written it down here the tough gi the dashing fighter pilot the taciturn naval commander the londoner you know cockney tommy who's you know is plucky resourceful and the, the those are the those are the stereotypes but clearly with millions of people serving in uniform from literally all over the world uh of different ages different that they, they, they they can't all fit into those um those categories so Start us off with your your you know your bio your your interest in World War Two and where it all came from. Yeah, it's quite weird, really, because it wasn't it encouraged at home. Like far from it. My parents are very strong Christians and, and pacifist. I wasn't allowed guns as a kid. Um, but of course, I think as soon as you tell a child they're not allowed something, they're going to go and do it, which is kind of story of my life in many ways. Um, so I was always making guns out of sticks and, uh, you know, I was into steam trains and machines. And then I got that kind of did slip slightly into into war machines until I guess probably about eight or nine. It really started taking over. Uh, I got my first uh, model kit was a, a Warhawk, Curtis Warhawk. And the big the thing is I start the book with actually and I was reminded of this recently. I went to RAF Coningsby. And I was looking around the village church and there were these um, the typhoons were doing uh, circuit and bumps. And two like came blasting over the church tower. And it took me back to the start of the uh, men of war, which is when I was on holiday in Norfolk in the uh, 80s. And the Jaguars from Coltishall flying mm. overhead and this feeling of like, this is really ominous. This is to do with war in a way that isn't like my model kits at home. It isn't like the books I'm reading. And that that made it this sort of slightly more more intense obsession i think and it just went on and on you know i was obsessed with the battle of all the obvious stuff you know you like when you're a kid the kind of the big the big ones the the the, the smash hits of world war Two. you know like hint hunting for the bismarck the battle of britain uh dunkirk uh dam busters you know all of the kind of greatest hits of british um action in the in the in the second world war building model kits reading all the books novels uh the whole the whole lot really so that and, and that obsession went on kind of into my teenage years and I guess I, I, I music really took over my day job is writing about music and that you know I'm quite an obsessive person I think and it sort of transferred from war to to music um though a lot of the music I like bands like Sea Power uh, the very obscure sort of groups like British Sea Power lie back they're often they're often uh influenced by the second world war but it was in recent years that interest really came roaring back i got i got properly back into the model kits a bit better at now bought an airbrush um got really interested in reading memoirs again reading reading the histories uh and and sort of find, looking for looking for evidence of the war of the landscape became a bit of an obsession looking for sort of uh, old airfields and, and fortifications and stuff which then uh, fed into the book and then you know, I was me and my wife um, were going to have a kid, and it was going to be a little boy. And I started thinking a bit more deeply about what it meant to have a kid and to think about war. And particularly, as her her ancestry is Polish Jewish, um, right. so the Holocaust had a huge impact on her life. And I was kind of thinking about our son, and you know, the Holocaust is part of his family history in a way that the war is just so different in my family history. But together, they they, they appear in him. So that that's the kind of what led me to, to to write the book, basically, and to, to be here now. 
Well, brilliant. And that, you know, the fact you mentioned the Holocaust there is it kind of dovetails with my next question, which is about this idea of national identity, because as, as a fellow Brit, although I live in France, is that, you know, you mentioned the, the greatest hits there, the Dan Busters raid, the hunt for the Bismarck, Bismarck things like that. There is a, a dewy eyed kind of, and, and pink spectacles, rosy attitude that some people have to World War Two. You know, the, the, the tank fest that you, you, you went to and there's the We Have Ways and, and, and those kind of festivals. There's a there's a nostalgia for the period that that clearly is there. And a lot of the people who watch my channel, they have a nostalgia for that. And they they, they love to see the Avro Lancaster and the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight five ahead. They like to see tanks. Uh, and yet they also acknowledge the fact that these are these are weapons of war. They are and I I have that every time I see a B-17 or a Lancaster, I look up and the 10-year-old boy in me goes, Oh wow, that's amazing. Oh my God. And I get the hairs that I don't have on the back of my neck stand up. <laughs> but the other part of me looks at it and goes, there is a machine that killed untold thousands, or not that particular aircraft flying, but that represents a killer of thousands of people. And I, I, I'm glad that I have that paradoxical kind of view of it, because it keeps my it keeps me sane and level, I think. I don't ever want to become one of those really obsessive, oh my God, it's, a, you know, it's all about the kit. And, and your book covers that interest in the kit you said it yourself you like the machinery you like the um the the the, the, the gadgetry the the weapons and yet also the heroes that we often re read about growing up again they did seem to fill fit into these particular stereotypes you had to be brave you had to be heroic you had to kind of do the the the, the, the teary farewell at the railway station the the, the steam train went off and you wrote your letters home and were very dry and what that that myth you're not trying to t tear down that myth, are you? What you're doing is examining it. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I, I didn't want to write a book that was kind of lazily iconoclastic or whatever. I, 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 I felt that would be disrespectful to the people who served and that, that my whole point of the book is to be respectful to that generation by looking at them in a more complicated way than perhaps um, they are usually. And, you know, I still love all the kit. I'm, I, hmm. You know, I, it's not like... Um, I'm questioning that. I mean, I do, I question it, but I, I'm still really into it. Like I was very lucky and got to have a little wander around the quite close up in the Battle of Britain Memorial flight hangar the other week. And it was, it was, it was incredibly exciting, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it's tinged with that awareness of what these machines are for. And I think that was the whole thing I was trying, I was trying to get at in the book is going, yes, these machines are pretty amazing and they still are. And they're very beautiful, stunning. I mean, I mean, tanks, I'm, I think they're more impressive. I, I, I still struggle with the beauty aspect of of tanks. I must admit, sorry for the for the military vehicle enthusiasts uh, watching, but you know, aeroplanes and ships still get me. I find them utterly beautiful. You know, every time there's a fly past in London, if you live in London, Bethnal Green Overground Station near Liverpool Street, you get the finest view of them all coming in. Uh, you right. know, and I watch those fly past, and I find it exciting and moving and. You know, particularly one for the Jubilee when they had so many Second World War aircraft going in, it was it was incredible. Um, so, I, but I, yeah, exactly. I, 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 like you say, I wanted to go. I have this obsession. I'm not going to sort of dismiss it or say it's problematic or anything. I just want to in, in, investigate it and really go deep into what it what it what it is about that, that I, about these machines. I still love, but also to go. Have we lost sight of the people within the machines sometimes? Yeah. Uh, with, with these these kind of stereotypes uh, that have grown up and the sort of, yeah, due, slightly sentimental way which with which veterans are seen in some quarters maybe. And I, and I felt that that just denied them their um, right to be complicated, thorny, uh, messy, deep individuals. To, to You know, they all... They all, they all were, and I, I think it's, to me, to my mind, it's very beautiful to try and look into that depth and see them as, not as modern people, but as people like us who were complex and did bad things and had were full of love and lust mm. uh, and all these thorny, knotty emotions that, that is what's, what's make, make us who, who we are as humans. And that that existed during the war. It wasn't like everybody went in into the military, like I have a, a line in a book, you know, from this punch cartoon where there's all these men in civilian clothes and suddenly they're all in their uniforms very upright and they all look the same. And I think, you know, in the time of mass conscription, 
you can try that as much as you want as a military, but you're never going to achieve that uniformity. And I think that's very beautiful. And I, and I, I was excited by looking underneath that and finding these, these complex characters. And then it was, you know, it was an army of civilians or a navy of civilians. It, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a professional army. It was people who became professional in World War II to get the job done and then went back to a often very different types of lifestyle. I often think about, you know, living in Normandy, as I see the, the veterans associations come over, those that join the Normandy Veterans Association or the British Legion, or they join their particular squadron or regiment uh, uh, association. But I have never attended a school reunion. I, I'm, I don't see myself as a sort of person to ever go to a school reunion. So I wonder whether the people who go and became part of the associations are a particular type and whether there are, are thousands, tens of thousands, who never felt really that drawn to that association type world. But yet that's how we, we the, the veterans that we have any interaction with now are the ones that are normally part of some kind of organized association they're the ones who attend the reunions that's why the film crews go there and meet them and and i and as your book explores there are lots of people who probably didn't fit into that kind of category of wanting to wear the tie and putting the blazer on and putting the medals out and so you know one of the things i was wanted to ask you about is how difficult is it to find accounts of people who didn't fit neatly in those categories because there are lots of biographies that pretty much could be written about the same kind of individual. We're going back to dashing fighter, fighter pilot and the taciturn naval commander. How much material is there out there of people who don't fall into that category? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the really interesting thing. I mean, I, I do find that I I'm actually write, was writing today about 158 Squadron of Bomber Command, their association, because they're trying to work out whether to carry on now or the veterans have died. And um, there's some interesting writing in, in some of the memoirs about the complexity of the men who were at that 158 Squadron reunions and how they you know, weren't united by jingism, jingoism or martial spirit. It was just remembering their youth. But I do think that's a good point that were, there must have been a lot of people who wouldn't have felt comfortable going to the, that event, even for a very welcoming organisation like 158. People like you and I who don't like reunions, especially. But yeah, I mean, I, when I started the book, my plan had been to go into um, – uh, archives, uh, um, museum sort of facilities, uh, national archives, and speak to veterans. But I started pretty much for the full-on writing the book in March 2020, which, as as everyone will know, was a really bad time to, to try and Trouble do this research, yeah. project. Because suddenly I couldn't do anything. And I had wanted to talk um, to, to lots of veterans, but then obviously that was suddenly becoming incredibly hard because everyone was shielding and um, you know, and I think it's also because I was trying to do this book that was around masculinity and sexuality and things like that. It's quite difficult to go up to a centenarian and say, uh, "Do you want to have a conversation about sort of sex life in the Second World War?" That's uh, that that's quite a difficult thing to do. Though I did have those sorts of conversations with people who were around at the time, and I had some amazing chats with them. But what I found interesting was. Obviously, in the Second World War, there were plenty of gay and bisexual men in the military. And some of them afterwards wrote memoirs or spoke to oral histories about their life in the war. And they have a very unique perspective because they they were always outsiders in masculinity yeah. and, and among their units. Um, but they were often very frank and honest. And what I realised was these these gay men and bisexual men in their records were leaving a very interesting trace of male behaviour among their supposedly heterosexual normal men. He's like, I'll use that. Normal comes up a lot in the world, this idea of the normal man going into the military. And so through some of these uh, um, gay and bisexual men, you get this sort of interesting perspective on a more rough and ready side of masculinity and a more sexual side of masculinity. And these supposedly heterosexual men who they were serving with, but also had sex with. And there's a, a lot because for gay men, the Second World War, by and large, was incredibly liberating. There was, it was a, a freer time than they'd ever known. Um, so that was one way in. But then I was also going, you know, I, one of the things I've, I've enjoyed on the We Have Ways podcast and reading other military historians is when they decided of walking the ground, you know, going yeah. to where the war was fought and understanding it. And I, I sort of had this concept of like walking the psychic terrain, which is a sort of slightly grand way of saying it maybe, but um, using uh, memoir and art and, and cultural artifacts to 
kind of look use use them to sort of look in in the in the in a sort of different way as, as history because so many memoirs are very or well, so many novels of the war are very thinly disguised autobiography anyway and it's not much uh difference um in terms of what actually happened and what the person wrote about and so i was using using novels and comparing them to real life incidents that we knew about to try and get an insight as well um and uh, to say someone like julian mclaren ross uh, who's quite a famous writer he's sort of you know part of the drinking in uh, Bloomsbury, ended up totally homeless and degenerate, who was a respected writer for a while. But he wrote a book, which I recommend to anyone watching, called The Stuff to Give the Troops, which was published in 1943. Uh, it's out of print. Um, you have to pretty much go to a library if you're not going to spend a fortune. And it's amazing because it's about his experiences sort of early in the war, about just sort of 19, late 1940, early 41, when the British Army is in quite a lot of disarray there's loads of recruits coming in and it's this sort of frank and uh warts and all quite funny but very poignant account of just these blokes who don't really want to be there and they've got terrible wrecks of uniforms if no uniform at all always trying to sort of slightly dodge the system uh it's it's brilliant it's a brilliant book but it feels very true to life and it's it, it the parallels between that and then his memoirs of the 40s are incredibly close so I wanted to sort of look at this this sort of slipperiness between fact and fiction because we all know that that happens with supposed factual accounts, veteran accounts changing over time. Um, is a constant thing I keep seeing historians discussing how war films influence veteran testimony, repetition, yeah. veteran testimony, things like mass observation. Um, is you know that's seen as being an authentic document of of the time. But then when they re-interviewed a load of people about specific events, I think in the, a few decades later, people started to bring themselves closer to what the action they were describing that had been. So say somebody said a V2 landed a mile away. Suddenly the V2 was in the next street. Yeah. And, you know, and, and they were the kind of people, again, who would be contributing to people's history, uh, you know, call outs and so on. So I felt that if the actual historiography was very slippery, why not go one step further and look at these this sort of blurred lines between fiction and fiction and memoir? And that also that connects as well with this idea of masculinity and and being a hero because you know I, one of the other things that annoys me is when some you know something on Facebook says they were all heroes and you go well yeah a lot of them were a huge majority of them were but some people who served in world war ii struggled with the whole concept they they didn't find it easy they struggled with being away from home they struggled with killing other human beings they struggled with just the routine and and this blanket label of they were all heroes i know what people mean by it. they're trying to be grateful they're trying to show their respect to the greatest generation and i understand it but of course, the actual reality is much more complex than that, isn't it? So masculinity as well, because I think tied up with your idea about how oral histories change over the, over the years, I think also people perhaps may become more heroic in the telling of the stories or as people tell them about them or they or they distance themselves from heroism. The amount of time as I've had people say, oh, I didn't do anything, it was him over there. And then the other guy says, no, it wasn't me, it was him over there. And they both say the other one was the hero and, and they play down their own their own role there, which... And so that gets complicated. Then you have this whole idea, as as you explore, about the sexuality and and the fact that these men are, well, they're horny young men, most of them, and and women, and 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 they want to do what all young men do, which is have sex and procreate and have fun. And that seems to have been, in some ways, jettisoned from a lot of the histories that these men were, you know, um, in between moments of of fa facing death, they were, they were living uh, living their lives. And so how how easy is it to kind of cover that mid ground because as you said there there were gay and bisexual men serving and women as well and there were obviously the straight men who went away and left their wives and sweethearts home and came back but in the middle there's this gray area i mean how, how do you define that gray area of people who you know would would enjoy some kind of closeness with their comrades but not classify themselves even by today's multi-term labeling system you wouldn't be able to put a label to them how, how difficult was it kind of identifying those kind of people yeah i mean that that's the the thing because i think you it, it, see I, I was i was trying not to define them even something like yeah. 
Bisexual is a um, uncom. Uh, is a, I don't like that term now, really, because it's too polarizing. And I do yeah. think I've always felt there's a grey area. And I, I do, I do think that you know there were men who who wanted intimacy in some way, and so they sought it with their comrades. And maybe that was sexual, maybe it wasn't, and they would still class themselves as being entirely straight. I would say they're probably on some grey area of the Kinsey scale or whatever you yeah. want to call it. Um, and I mean, obviously, this stuff doesn't leave very much in the historical record. Uh, it's very interesting that for all the millions of men who were in the forces during the Second World War and for all that homosexual acts were out uh, completely forbidden, only uh, 1,428, 1,428 uh, men were court-martialed, convicted for uh, any kind of homosexual offence, which is kind of incredible given that after the war, that number even in London went up um, considerably in terms of prosecutions. So mm -hmm. there was a blind eye turn to things. But then, as I say, these accounts that men did leave are absolutely full of sexual <laughs> experiences. So if so, if these few gay men were seem to be having sex with quite a lot of other men who weren't gay, then the ones who didn't write memoirs and were utterly silent probably were as well. I mean, and yeah. this is the thing: it is, it is. What I, I guess. I, I don't think we'll ever know this stuff because it's it's unquantifiable. It's never really, it's not it's not really medical. Maybe you make it count for it in some medical records, perhaps. But, um, you know, not, not not everyone was getting VD from women. Um, yeah, and and there, there just are these, just, there's just so many accounts, particularly from this guy, Colin Spencer, um, I interviewed, who was a teenager through the war. So it was very interesting getting his perspective. And afterwards was a... Um, did his national service in the ruins of Hamburg, working in a VD clinic, and and he wrote a book, a history of homosexuality. And he he's not a, a gay; he's um, he's fluid somewhere in the middle. And he says, you know, all the gay men and women he spoke to writing that book would talk about how the Second World War was a happy time. Well, not not a happy time, but in terms of their sexuality, it was a lot freer. Um, but it does all connect to the idea of heroics, because I think, you know, I very much grew up with the idea that who were the old gay men who were around or, or the gay men who were around during the Second World War? It was basically like Kenneth Williams Ken yeah. Crest and Crisp, because even when I was a kid in the 80s, 90s, that's kind of what your association was with older gay men. It was camp, effeminate, not what you'd expect, not the characters I was seeing in war films. You know, they were they were they were men's men, you know, uh, or I was reading in books. And so they almost felt like there's this idea that, you know, these men who were gay were not among the heroes of the Second World War as they were depicted in culture. But then writing a book, one of the characters I cover is um, Ian Gleed, um, yeah. who is the 80th anniversary of his death on, um, on Sunday, on the 16th of April. He was shot down in 1943 um, off the coast of Tunisia. And um, he wrote a very, you know, exciting memoir of his time in the Battle of France and the Battle of Britain called A Rise to Conquer, which is the account of how he became the fastest uh, achieving ace in the RAF, uh, was all up fighting in his hurricane. Um, you know, it's all like Wizzo, jolly good, rat -a tat tat You know, it's absolute archetypal Second World War, Battle of Britain, heroics. And he he got the DFC, DSO, Quoi de Guerre. Um, and in the memoir, he writes about Pam, who is his lover. Uh, and he always thinking of Pam, even when he's going to battle. He rings Pam when he's been in a scrape. And then when his family read the memoir, they were very confused because they didn't know who Pam was. They never met her, even though he says they have. Uh, and it turns out that um, there was somebody who did fit the character of Pam, who's mentioned in his biography, uh, who is a younger man uh, who went sailing with him, did all the stuff that Ian Glee did with Pam, uh, this, this fella did. And then in the 90s, there was a documentary uh, uh, about gay and lesbian life in the Second World War, uh, which is really good. Um, and on in that, uh, another pilot talked about how he'd had sex with Ian Gleed uh, at RAF Middle Wallop, which... <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately. <laughs> but, but and so it was really interesting, this sort of archetypal Battle of Britain bashing hero. You know, he, he's there, the photo, and he's, he's there with, with Richard Hillary and everyone being decorated by the king. You know, you don't get much more archetypal 
back, uh, Second World War hero than Ian Glee. But he was a, a gay man and a warrior and a, and a very brave man who, you know, gave up his desk job, demanded to be posted back to a squadron and ended up being shot down and, and killed. So I, I thought that was really brilliant how um, you had a you had a proper World War II hero who was also gay. And I think, you know, from the other perspective, I guess in the kind of world I'm in, that there's in LGBT world or art world or whatever, I'm in left-wing world perhaps, there's this view that, oh, actually, you know, gay people aren't, Marshall, we don't want we don't want gay people to be um, like that. And I was saying, no, no, no. We, of course, of course, gay people are incredibly brave. I mean, there was there's one account uh, from a sort of interwar text about uh, one gay man wrote a, a book about being gay, precise and, and the persecution he experienced precisely because in the trenches, some of the bravest people he had ever uh, met and, and who were decorated, one Victoria Cross and and, and all sorts, uh, were gay. Um, and, and you look at someone like Seafried Sassoon, who was a man of complicated sexuality. And everyone thinks of Seafried Sassoon as a sort of pacifist war poet. But there was the time after the man he was kind of in love with died, where Seafried Sassoon would go on personal killing missions and, and mm. just disappear off with knives and grenades and, and, and attack German trenches. And, and I thought it was very interesting that we don't see that, you know, either from the LGBT world doesn't celebrate those kind of complex, more violent figures. And maybe the other side don't sort of accept that gay people could be as heroic as anybody else. And I wanted to sort of bring all that together and, and hold that, hold these people up in that way. Which you do. And I think, you know, I can imagine that with, with something like your, your writing is people would expect you to sort of stay in your lane and, and you know, and write for the LBGT press and talk about the, the you know, the, the, the 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 absolute as you've defined them the game met people who served in world war ii but not necessarily go into this this mid ground of of the of the people we can't really put in a category and and it brings us back as well to this idea of the people who are interested in world war ii fulfilling a certain type of of uh, uh, stereotype i mean i know exactly who my audience is on world war ii uh, or world war ii tv because the youtube data tells it to me you know the 95 percent of my viewers are between 50 and 70 they're male uh, and they're the people who read the military books and watch the documentaries and, and buy the airfix kits and, and and have the model Sherman tanks on their bookshelves. And that's absolutely fine. Without them, I would not be doing what I'm doing. But of course, there is a, a, a more complex set of people who are interested in this history. And I think we shouldn't allow, uh, be stuck with this. You can't change lane. You know, there's there's there, we can write a Gay, gay writers writing about gay people who served in World War II for a gay audience. And then there's a conventional audience writing about the dashing married men writing for that audience. It, an overlap surely is, is, is beneficial to everybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I am, I'm, I've only got five years till I'm in your core demographic and I'll be watching your <laughs> films and I'll still be, you know, my, hopefully my, I've not, I've only, I'm actually building Ian Glead's Hurricane at the moment, but it's taken me a whole year and I've, I'm still just on masking up the canopy because I've got a one year old baby and it means my model making is uh, behind. But by the time I'm 50 and I'm in your core demographic, I fully intend to be building the stash in my cupboard. Brilliant. And, and I felt, I, I'm fed up in life of being pigeon, this sort of pigeonholing that happens, particularly in a moment with, with kind of concepts of masculinity and particularly men of a certain age so you could say it's sort of like this this sort of i do feel that we're all shoved into one box and it's got toxic marked on it and we're sort of shoved it put in a cupboard and they, they want to shut a lead door and i said it's like no i'm a bloke i'm of a certain age i love building model kits i'm fascinated by the second world war i also happen to be someone who's not entirely heterosexual and i'm very interested in gay culture and art and so on and i, and I don't see any contradiction between those two I don't, I don't even see sides of myself. It's just that's who yeah. I am. And I, what I hope with this book is that people will kind of go along with me in that, you know, and, and be up for embracing uh, this. Because, you know, the book, when I write about sex, I'm not just writing about um, gay sex at all. I've, I've got a whole chapter about desire and masturbation, you know. You never, you know. Yeah, yours you, was the first World War II book to have a chapter on masturbation, I have to say. You know, that I, I did... <laughs> I did chuckle as I was reading it. Going, yeah, that's that's a first. You know, yeah, that and and I found it really interesting. You know, it was. It, it, it it is, you know, was all those. I mean, I can't. How many men in who of the millions who uh, served in the Second World War didn't at one point? Uh, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure what what language we can use on. Don't, don't we, we, we we all know what we're talking about. Yeah. 
But you know, and, and I thought that was really interesting. Why is that removed? Why is that not discussed? I mean, but the thing is, it's sort of it, it's implicit. It's all very sort of wink, wink, isn't it? Because it's that hand hands off cocks and on socks. Is yeah. like the, 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 it's in so many different uh, books, films, and so on. But that's about as far as you you end up getting, apart from sort of joke. There's a lot of banter about it, I think. But I wanted to look at it as a really exciting energy that all men had. That was a, must have been of great comfort, to be honest. While they were, you know. You know, the thing that we don't really talk about in a lot of the war interest is the boredom and the loneliness and just the hours around not feeling uncomfortable with nothing much to do apart from your dreary routine. And what could be a more liberating thing to do than have a, a private moment? <laughs> is, uh... Well, not necessarily that private, given that you might be in a prisoner war camp or, or a barrack block. You know, yeah, there exactly. are always you know, the occasions to go on and we're going off and... Well, this is a different, a different rabbit hole for World War II TV, but I, I, I like the idea of talking about the fact that these, these people away from home were, were experiencing a different type of life for that period of World War II. Because one of the quotes I wanted to get in, I, I, was, I was getting drunk with Earl McClung, who's one of the characters in Band of Brothers. You know, he's not in the series much, but he's in the book a lot. And Earl had, had quite a few beers. And Earl said, he said, no one has made a World War II film about how soldiers in battle love each other. And he said, I don't mean broke back mountain and khaki, which cracked us all up because we, yeah. we just we were just in laughing. He said, No, I mean the love I had for the get the men, the man beside me in the foxhole. You know, and he said, I've, I'm married, I've got kids, but nothing will ever replace that love I had for the guy I was in a foxhole with, with for, for hours or days on end because you faced adversity, you faced death together, and you talked about everything and you shared experiences. And so we, we were laughing, and then suddenly it went very serious. And then he said, Oh, stop you, yeah, I'm getting all serious now. And he kind of went on to something else again. But to me, that's a really, really compelling um, story about, about the, the bond men who face combat together share that perhaps I don't see going back to the idea of the Blazers and the Medals Association. That that kind of doesn't come out. Of course, they lay wreaths at each other's at the graves of their comrades and they get very teary-eyed, but I don't know that they really demonstrate it in that kind of very, very natural way where you would just hug each other. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if that, you know, Americans are always, can be more expressive and less reserved than perhaps... So maybe that was a difference. I mean, I, I, I think in the book, I, I didn't I didn't write so much about comradeship in that way, because I felt that that that's that I think is actually very beautifully covered in a lot of more conventional right. war writing. I, I think it's it's true. It's not really there in the, the war films, but I do feel I often see it in war writing. Um but though I, when my focus on 158 Squadron Bomber Command and their motto was strength in unity, and so I write about about, about uh, a lot about the kind of crewing up a, a bomber and that utter, utter mutual dependence for sort of seven, eight hours over um, on an operation, just you utterly reliant on one another and the closeness of those crews when they were, you know, on an, on an airfield like RAF Lisset, where I went quite a few times and in a desolate, east, flat, windy, cold East Yorkshire, and you'd appear and you, you, the crews would be there for such a short time because of the attrition rape. Um, but they had a very intense bond. And there's a, a very, well, I think one of my, I'd recommend it, um, people interested in Bomber Command, a memoir called, um, uh, by Alan Lomas called, uh, oh, this is my, it's gone from my head, One Wing, one wing down, I think maybe. Um, but it's Alan Lomas, it's 158 Squadron Memoir. You'd be able to find it online. And he writes again very beautifully about the connection he had with uh, uh, and the intensity, quiet intensity mm -hmm. of that connection, that brotherly connection he had with um, some of the other men at, at the um, reunion and when they went back for the reunion. Um, and I think I felt that was quite moving. And and that just of interest in the squadron. Uh, motto just really sums that up that strength in unity I mean, it's more kind of grand but behind that is a sort of intimacy i think brilliant so to move back towards the kind of the national vision of, of world war ii because that's the other bit you talk about we've kind of talked a little bit about sexuality and, and lust and love but 
you know, 80 years on from, from 1943 now, next year will be the 80th anniversary of, of D-Day and Market Garden. You know, as someone who's coming at this from a slightly different field than perhaps some of my regular military historians, where do you think we are in, in, in understanding it? And, and does it vary from the UK to the US? Does the UK have a uniquely British way of looking at World War II compared to the US, compared to Australia, compared to Germany? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that we're in this sort of 1943 phase because it's such a sort of pivotal but little, you know, it's not got the greatest hits in really, apart from the Dambusters, uh, necessarily in the kind of British imagining. You know, it's that sort of, I remember when I was a kid, it was always like, like Battle of Britain, D-Day, uh, and, and you can be obsessed with 40 and 44 and a bit of 45. But there was a sort of gap in the middle where it was sort of like what was going on there. It didn't, it didn't seem to be represented so much in, in stuff I encountered as a kid. Now that's different, of course, from reading. But I mean, what part of what inspired the book, to be honest, was just how frustrated I was and, and kind of upset I was. I found myself getting with the way that the war has been exploited in Britain for yeah. political ends. Um, and I have a, you know, it start, I, I first felt it in 96 when um it was the euro uh euros final and i'd been really into football and pretty much until this point big i'm a big west ham fan uh but national football really put me off and it was like the peers more on uh, morgan did um <laughs> sorry i they always call him that private ice i always call him that peers morgan did that front cover of the mirror which was um you know the actung for you, the war is over with like stuart pierce in a tin helmet and this awful editorial in the sort of style of chamberlain Chamberlain's declaration of war and and it it was just I just thought it was in such appalling taste and then when England predictably lost on those penalties a load of blokes went down to Trafalgar Square smashed stuff up did the kind of 10 German bombers chant you know two world wars one world cup all this nonsense and yeah you can say it's just banter but I think there's something quite nasty behind that that English football nationalism and how, how, and I felt it was very offensive to the memory, to the stuff I was still just about interested in at that point uh, with the second world war. And then in recent years, I just feel like around Brexit, it was just, just summoned constantly by the leave uh, people, all the, the generation who were too young to fight saying, you know, summoning the second world war over and over again in the leave campaign. And then in coronavirus, it was the same thing again, the blitz spirit and all of this people saying in the war, the pubs were stayed open. People need to be, a, you know, made of sterner stuff. And he said, yeah, but a, if you went to a pub in an air raid and a bomb hit it, that's kind of your choice. And it's the pub's choice to be open. It, coronavirus doesn't kill you in the same way. It's not the same thing. It was just, it was just exasperated. Yeah. It's sort of, very narrow interpretation of the war that was that was being used in British culture, and I just felt this. I just felt it was. I want. I, I felt quite upset by it, to be honest. It just didn't feel to me to be representative and unfair on this kind of hugely complicated group of people who did these incredible things and had to suffer violence and pain and loss, but also boredom and privation and their lives being on hold and just the agony of not knowing where your family are at home, whether they're being faithful, all this stuff was just being reduced to this narrow, quite nasty, toxic, anti-European argument. You know, the whole point of the EU was to stop us having these yeah. wars, you know, and, and then you often see um, interviews with people who were in that war who were very pro-Europe and spoke very eloquently about it because they saw it as an important part of ensuring there would be peace. Well, and, and it's, a, it's a sort of a bit of a cliche, but the amount of times you see someone saying, uh, uh, somebody sort of saying, I left, I lived through the war and I didn't expect to, you know, you know and I'm not happy with this, this, you know, ranting away. And it's like, you were three or you were born in 1946, you're a baby boomer. It's like, you know, they, well, I, they're, I, they're, re they're remembering... A Britain that never existed. The, 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 you know, we, we talk about on this channel the you know the Britain standing alone in 1940. Except even in 1940, that wasn't what Britain was telling itself. Britain was celebrating the Indian troops marching down Pall Mall and the and the Gurkhas and the Pol Poles and the Czechs. Things. It, it's 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 now that we've somehow ended up with this Britain stood alone. I mean, a few years ago, one of the anniversaries is in the leading up to Brexit. Nigel Farage. I saw him in Aramanche. I was waiting for someone. It was June the sixth. He was there with a the film crew in his tweeds and his you know his 
wax jacket and all that kind of bullshit. And he was trying to interview World War, uh, World War II veterans who were there to get him to kind of get on board his Britain standing alone, you know, we should be out of Europe. And I'm thinking, you're completely asking the wrong people. If these yeah. British veterans are here in France and averse, because they like France, because they like traveling, they want to be part of Europe. They want to be part of people who are there from different nations coming together to commemorate working together to defeat uh, 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 the Third Reich. And so I, I didn't understand how his thinking was working. I mean, the fact I can't stand the guy anyway, but what, what he, what, who was he expecting to find there who was of his mindset? I couldn't work that out, out at all. So, you know, this, this idea we have of uh, the, these, these myths, Britain standing alone, and you know, are, we ever, are we stuck with that now? Because, you know, my channel reaches a few thousand if I'm lucky, to, over you know, tens of thousands if I'm really lucky. But out there, the things like that, that, you know, that newspaper headline about, I remember that one. I remember that, that where the Stuart Pierce with the Tommy helmet on. Are we stuck with that because of how many people who buy into that? Or are we going to have a more nuanced view of what World War II was about? Well, if everyone buys my book, then then maybe good that point. yeah. Can, and I, good it's, point it's, to mention the links to purchasing it are in the description below, folks. And and you will really enjoy it. On I promise you, whoever you are, read, read whether you're an aircraft enthusiast or perhaps not if you're a tank enthusiast, because you're I, not. I, you're I, really... I did great time at Tank First. I had a really good time. I'm not. Down, I'm not down on tanks. They just don't move me in the same way. Um, but I, I don't know. I do think it's. I do think it's interesting because there is that sort of more perhaps reaction that. that sort of view is going to die out um but then i i must admit i find i worry about some of the more i, I don't know i guess i'm kind of always interested in things that are complicated and I, I i'm always embrace complexity i do worry that a backlash is going to be this sort of like oh actually this is problematic this was bad you know i mean it does exist already the arguments about wearing a poppy is the poppy actually yeah, a sign yeah, of yeah yeah post-war british imperialism um, you know the the arguments around Ch you know Churchill being a, a a racist warmonger, which I you know very much see among particularly people a bit younger than me, and it's sort of you know actually he was just a complicated and very flawed person. And yes, he was racist, but he was also by and large a very good leader. Can't we can't we just say all of these things? It can be both of those things at the same time. Yeah, exactly. The time. Whereas there, you know, well, on one hand, there's the sort of Churchill was an unimpeachable hero. I mean, you can't criticize him. On the other hand, it's sort of like he was a terrible racist warmonger who, you know, destroyed German cities and caused the Bengal, you know, made the Bengal famine worse. And I just don't like these polarised views from both sides. You know, this book is not from that kind of anti-Churchill perspective or, or whatever at all. And, you know, stuff, you know, um, right, 158 Squadron, I wanted to have Bomber Command in specifically because I think... It, 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 I, I, get, I get quite fed up, and I think they were treated shoddily after the war, not having a medal, not not yeah. having a memorial. I'm, I'm not a big fan of the Green Park Memorial, to be honest, but they got their memorial in the end. And I get sort of quite up, uh, uh, cross about these endless things that come up, say the bombing of German cities was a war crime, and I think it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so I, I, so I think there is there is a, a new, more nuanced history of the war is totally possible, and I, I feel like there's a lot of um, a lot of work being done to show more balanced view. People like yourself, people like we have ways. Uh, a lot of um, historians who use social media very well to tell tell stories more in a more nuanced and complex way. That uh, Jonathan Ware, ESS history guy, yeah. who's he, he's he's really good at kind of pointing this stuff out. So I kind of I'm kind of hopeful that we will see a, a more nuanced approach. I mean, it will be interesting to see whether younger generations are, are still really into it and, and in, interested in the same way. Um, I, I wonder about that. But then, you know, stuff like Call of Duty is like the airfix kit and comics of yeah, the sure. modern yeah, generations. Yeah. Those games, I think, do bring people into the into being interested in it. You know, Tank Fest audience was pretty young. There was a lot of kids there. Um when I go to air museums, it was all, I went to Cosford last year, and it was I was almost like a grumpy old man. There's kids everywhere <laughs> <laughs> trying to look at the lightning. Um, so I do think generations are going to come through interested in it. I imagine it's not going to be off the school curriculums at any any point soon. So I think if we can have a, a, a view that kind of goes, yes, it was complicated. What is more complicated and difficult than war? Uh, and a time when your entire society is turned on its head and, and put onto a war effort. And I think if we can em embrace that complexity rather than having these tired 
culture war type argument mm. with two sides blasting at each other pointlessly, then if we could get some sort of more complex discussion going, then that's only going to be a good thing. Yeah, and for fear of asking like, the cliché interviewing uh, of an author question, but what are your hopes for the book? Because I'm assuming you want people from the conventional military history world to read it, but also from the, the, the music LBGT kind of world as well. And, and have you had any people from that world that saying you shouldn't be going into World War II, that's not, that's not for us, you know, stay in your lane? No, no, not not yet. I mean, maybe that that will happen. It'd be kind of interesting if I got sort of critiques from both both sides. I mean, yeah, some, yeah, stuck in the middle, both 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 ends having both a go at you. Yeah, yeah. But you know, if, if everyone hates enough to buy buy it for a hate read, then you know, <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> sale is a sale is a sale, isn't it? But no, what up? But your hopes, obviously, you know, you want people to just have more of a, a nuanced view that the, the people yeah. who served were from different walks of life. And and to be honest, I really wrote it for. The, in some ways, I wrote it for the more conventional war interest people. Yeah. You know, it, it, that's that's kind of why it's structured like it is. With so much, the book's got a lot about sort of the machines at the start, tank fest, and the RAF, and and this idea. I got really obsessed with this idea of of metal as this strange substance that sort of defines the war and sits in opposition to the sort of fragility of the human body, um, and this idea that. You know, that where where did all that metal go from the Second World War? You know, that you, you always um, wonder the atoms, are they still around from bombers that flew over Germany? What What's happened to all that in a sort of quite cosmic sense? So I kind of wrote the book for people who were really interested in this sort of hardware and metal and, and, and all of that, and who grew up with, like I did, reading books, watching war films, building kits. Um, but I wanted everyone to be able to... It's like I wanted to have a, a sort of big... Second World War chat with everybody involved and yeah. try and try and see what would happen. So, yeah, I, can't, I, I don't know what it's a bit weird writing a, a book because you you know I'm very proud of it. I didn't have to compromise on anything at all. My editors amazing, my publishers are amazing. So you know what, what you can't really ask for more, but than than not having to compromise. And I didn't write it with any sense of well, I can't say that because it might wind certain people up i was just trying to be honest so hopefully it will uh appeal to everyone rather than disappearing down the middle <laughs> well it certainly appealed to me and as i said before you went live the fact that i keep moving it around on my shelves is a good compliment because i didn't quite know where to put it it sat with kind of jonathan fennell and alan allport as like a study of 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 the people in war then i moved it beside i think al murray and eddie Izzard, and those kind of books of people who touch on world war ii as part of their childhood and then it moved again to my minorities section, and then it'll move again somewhere else. And and it'll probably keep it's been on my desk as I've been leading up the show there. But I, I love the fact it 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 leapt from, from different themes and so much of it I didn't identify with, you know, the, the reenactment issue and, and the, the cliches and, and breaking these cliches. And 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 uh, yeah, and I, I really wish you well with it. And uh, and I, I, I hope we, we you know, you come back and do more World War II um, writing because it, you've really got, got, to, be you've got a, a way of looking at it, which is which is which is nice and, re and refreshing, I think. Yeah, I'm I, I, I'm really I'm sort of like have visions of being able to just write war novels, but I'm, I'm sure I'll get told by the publishers that nobody buys them anymore or something like that. I don't know. But yeah, thank you. That's really nice to hear. Cheers. Well, thank you. So, so as I say, it's uh, it's available uh, in the links below. It's available in all good bookshops, and uh, and and I can't wait to sort of see how how it how it flourishes and and have you back again in a year when you've written the, the definitive book about armor or something. You know, you've you've, yeah. you've converted it. You've actually started to do a big tanks in Normandy study, and yeah. uh, that'll be really fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, so thanks, everybody. I'll be back again in another uh, 40 minutes with Jonathan uh, Fen uh, James Fenelon. But right now, thank you very much, Luke Turner, for joining me. And thank you, everybody, for watching. This is Paul Willard for World War II TV saying see you again later. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.